In this episode, I bring on guest Dr. John Lewis, an expert in nutrition and dietary supplements, mainly focusing on the benefits of polysaccharides for brain health and overall health. Dr. Lewis shares his personal journey, which began with sports and bodybuilding and eventually evolved into this research-focused career at the University of Miami. There was a lot of things that I thought I knew about complex carbohydrates, but Dr. John just took it to a whole new level. So if you're interested, stay tuned. Real quick, is losing weight after 40 while still enjoying your social life a challenge? Well, you're not alone because that's pretty much everybody. On the Over 40 Fitness Hacks podcast, I share insights from my 15 plus years as a personal trainer and gym owner, helping people like you strike the right balance. For those ready to take action, please sign up for my online personal training program on my website or through the link in the show notes. Together, we'll design a plan that fits your lifestyle and helps you achieve your goals without sacrificing the fun. And remember, everyone is different. We will find a program that works. So, Dr. Lewis, uh, I want to thank you for coming on my show. Hopefully, you can uh, teach us something about brain health, supplementation for the over 40 crowd, what we're missing. But as my audience always knows, I like to do the, the first episode, the topic geared more to how did you get into what you're doing? What were some of the discoveries that you saw during your research? And I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Brad. It's a pleasure to be here with you today and to talk to you and your listeners. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for coming on. It's my pleasure. I guess my origin story goes back all the way to when I was just a little kid, when my grandfather started pitching baseball to me in the backyard when I was about four, and it put me on a path to playing sports. I played pretty much anything other than soccer growing up. I had a ball attached to it. I would do a shot. And then after high school, I got in drug-free competitive bodybuilding, and... That didn't last too long. I, I went four or five years down that path, but Brad, quite frankly, I mean, unless you're truly willing to do two things, one, it has to be your total life. And then number two, if you really want to take it to something, you got to do drugs. I mean, yeah. there's just natural bodybuilders. I mean, who even knows who one is? I mean, they're completely unknown. No people. one wants to see it, sadly. <laughs> and there's only one Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? I mean, yeah. I guess you maybe could argue Lou Ferrigno got near Arnold's status, but other than those two people, who even knows who a broad bodybuilder is? But anyway, what bodybuilding did do, at least to the level that I took it, was that it got me very much focused on using nutrition and exercise as a way to achieve something with the body. And so I went from just playing sports, which was really more for fun and being with my buddies and having a good time competitively and all those different things to really taking on something that you have to commit to understanding what you're doing or else you won't do anything really. I mean, unless you're just a natural genetic freak, those people are one in a billion basically. So it really got me on a path of thinking about how the body responds to stressors primarily through what we put into our mouth and through how we move it. And so as I realized I was never going to make a living out of bodybuilding, I, I shifted my focus from say a sports physical performance perspective to a health perspective. And that was really what set me down a path of I mean, I, I didn't have any plans in college to become a researcher. That just happened as I went through my training and my degrees. But ultimately, it took me down a road of saying, well, science is interesting and I enjoy the academic lifestyle. And so as I began building a little niche for myself at the University of Miami at the medical school in those areas, I then met a couple of people who completely changed the course of my, not just my career, my life, introducing me to their own stories about Dr. Reg McDaniel on the aloe vera side and a lady, a patient from our cancer center, Barbara Kimley on the rice brand side. And Brad, again, those two people just completely changed my life. So I was already doing research in nutrition in dietary supplements in exercise. But then when I met these two folks and they shared with me their experiences, again, it took me on a whole different level. So I say all that to say that my story is, I guess, like a lot of people, it's long, it's evolving. I know my dinner as a comparison, my dinner said when he was a little guy, he knew from a very young age, he wanted to be a dentist. I was, that was not my story or, and I guess a lot of people aren't like that. Again, I've sort of been like a chameleon as I've passed through stages in life. I would meet people that would have an influence on me or I would find their perspective interesting or something that I wanted to pursue. And then I've just been on this long and winding road as the Beatles said. And so I'm still on a long and winding road. <laughs> Absolutely. It seems similar to my story, but you at least got it to opening up your world and discovering other people and peers that kind of took you down different avenues where I didn't really hit that until I started more of this podcast because I was more on the running a business and personal training and a lot of our clientele only really cared about aesthetics. So you got to 
give them what they want. And finally, around 35, I made that switch to more health and longevity. Look at the overall picture because the over 40 crowd or close to 40 crowd, everything starts falling apart. Nothing works right. right like they tell you in the muscle magazines and all that kind of stuff. And same thing. I've interviewed guests, probably a hundred guests by now, and I'm just absorbing so much information. And it's just great because you find those little moments that just up your game. So what were some of the things that you saw in your research that really stood out? Well, the thing that I've leveraged my, really my whole life on now, as I got to know Dr. McDaniel and, and Barbara, and again, them telling me about polysaccharides, and quite frankly, I may have had, I don't know, one or two lectures in biochemistry as a student about saccharides in general, knowing nothing about their use in the cells beyond being an energy source. And so for those of our listeners who don't know, saccharide is sugar. Saccharide is just the biochemical term for sugar. But when we as Americans have heard this for whatever it's been, maybe even going back half a century now, sugar is bad. Like anybody in our country, you hear the word sugar, I would guarantee 99 out of 100 people are going to immediately think bad. You don't even consider the idea that some type of sugar could be good for you. So this is an interesting moment where, as psychologists say, it's a teachable moment where I like to share with people that as a scientist, as a writer, as somebody who's very particular about our language, I want people to be careful about use, the use of the word sugar. Because again, you hear all these talking heads talk about how bad sugar is for you, but all they're doing is lumping every single sugar into the same bucket. So yeah. sugars have two primary characteristics that distinguish goodness versus badness, if you want to call it that way. So you have monosaccharides that are the simplest form of sugars like high fructose corn syrup. Yeah, I think most people would agree if you're eating high fructose corn syrup every day, that's probably not a good idea. It spikes your insulin, it spikes your glucose, it causes all these other metabolic complications that ultimately will set you up for type 2 diabetes, heart disease, cancer, or all the above. So that's definitely a sugar that we want to avoid for the most part, if not completely eliminate. Then you have disaccharides, a little more complexity in their structure, and the most common form of a disaccharide is sucrose or white table sugar, again... If you're eating that stuff every day, it's probably not a good idea. And then finally, you have polysaccharides, which are literally hundreds of glucose units attached together by these glycosidic bonds. And Brad, they're so complex in structure, you cannot even draw them on a paper. I mean, they're, yeah. like, they're almost like 5D models. And so these things are so complex. And the ones that my colleagues and I have studied on for all these years now, nearly going back 20 years from aloe vera and rice bran are just unlike any other material that I think Mother Nature provides for us in terms of potential health effects. So I say all that to say in defining different sugars is please be mindful and careful of use of the word sugar. It drives me nuts every time I hear somebody just make this blanket generic statement, sugar is bad for you. That is ignorant, uninformed completely wrong statement. You have to define the type of sugar. So I'm trying to help bring this type of conversation to the front because it's very important, especially in this day and age where we've got vegans and carnivores going at it and yep. you know, the crowd and the keto crowd, and you still got holdovers from the Atkins era. Yep. Animal yeah. base, which is like a hybrid now. And I mean, you just got all these factions, but people are just not when it comes to the word sugar, again, I just want people to be mindful that all sugar is not created equal, and there are many complex sugars. I mean, it's not just aloe vera and rice bran as well. You've got things like different types of mushrooms, shiitake, maitake, lion's mane, all these different types of exotic mushrooms. They're loaded with polysaccharide content. That's why they actually are very nutritious for us, among other nutrients they have. Different types of seaweeds have these very complex polysaccharides. Yeah. And so there are lots of plants in nature that provide these materials. I can't really speak to all those others, but the two that my colleagues and I focused on, aloe vera and rice bran, and don't take my word for it. I mean, we've actually published. This is based on our science. This isn't just ideas that we came up with and have nothing to back them with. We published and documented all this information. You can go to PubMed and, and verify what I'm saying. I'm not some guy out here making up ideas that sound good. And so... Again, circling all the way back, for me, like you're talking about learning from different people. Well, I mean, clearly what I learned from Dr. McDaniel and Barbara about these two particular polysaccharides totally changed not only my career, but my life. And so I've leveraged all that now into all this research that we've conducted. And I'm happy to go into a little more detail, especially the one about Alzheimer's, if, if you think that would be of interest since we're talking about people at the mid-age point or even a little bit older in terms of the folks that you work with and focus. Yeah. 
real quick, I know from at least my perspective as the personal trainer, our thing, I still probably lump more than I should into that sugar bin, like you were saying, but at least we had simple carbs and complex carbs, very right. simple. All the mm -hmm. sweet sugar stuff and then fruits and vegetables sure. and all that kind of stuff. At least that sure. was a, a, a simple basis that we could give our clients and, and get that mindset in it. But that's why I love bringing experts like you onto the show because I want to take now that complex bin and I want to expand on that. 